Welcome to Book Club with Jane Smiley. I'm Jay Ryan Straddle, author of Kitchens of the Great Midwest and the Logger Queen of Minnesota. Like Jane, I have a strong affection for the Midwest, and her Midwest settings are what first drew me to her work. It's my honor to host this event with her tonight. Before I introduce tonight's guest properly, allow me a moment to tell you a bit more about the unique series that is bringing her to us. Club Book is a program of MELSA, the Metropolitan Library Service Agency, made possible through Minnesota's Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and coordinated by Library Strategies, part of the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library. Carver County Library is the co-organizer of this evening's talk. Thanks also to partnering, to partnering bookseller, Red Balloon Bookshop. Purchase links to Jane's latest release, Perestroika in Paris, as well as her impressive backlist will be available in the comments section of this live stream feed. Have the book shipped, pick it up at the lovely store in St. Paul, or have Red Balloon deliver it personally to your door if you're in the area. One final housekeeping note. Also in the comments, you'll see a survey link. Melsa would greatly appreciate hearing what you think of this club book program. It's quick and easy. Now for our featured event. Pulitzer Prize winner Jane Smiley is, in the words of one recent reviewer, among America's most accomplished and wide ranging writers. Her 30 books to date include two short story collections, two biographies, and eight books geared towards young readers. Jane's influential and admired novels include the prize winning A Thousand Acres, a modern retelling of King Lear. Smiley returned to the heartland in her Last Hundred Years trilogy, which follows the fortunes and travives of an Iowa farm family over several generations. Smiley's latest Paris Troika in Paris offers fans something of a departure. In this instant bestseller, a spirited racehorse named Paris Troika, nicknamed Paris, escapes her enclosure outside Paris and tries to make a new life for herself. In doing so, she befriends a street smart dog named Frida, a pair of talkative ducks named Sid and Nancy, and a curious boy named Etienne. After a short reading by our guest, and some initial questions from me. We'll have time for audience Q&A. Simply drop your questions in the comments thread here on Facebook and our tech manager will route them to me. If you'd prefer to contribute a question a bit more anonymously, you can also send a private message to Clubbook here on Facebook or send an email to clubbookmn at gmail.com. Now, finally, let's welcome Jane Smiley. Hi, Jane. Hi, Jay Ryan, how are you? I'm good. <laughs> it's great to uh, great to see you again. Great to have you here in Club Book. Thank you. Now, you've selected something to read for us. I have. It's just the beginning. I, I like to read from the beginning because it's the setup. And maybe I could say this is such an oddball story that um, readers who haven't actually read it yet, they need the setup. So I'm going to read it. And I have to take my glasses off to do so. Mm -hmm. I, I do too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Paris had won her race. She had jumped all the jumps with a great deal of pleasure and she thought in excellent form. The number two horse, a chestnut gelding from down south somewhere had been so far behind her that she hadn't been able to hear his hoofbeats on the turf. And of course the crowd was yelling too. She had, she thought almost danced across the finish line. Everyone was happy. The jockey did a backflip off her. The groom gave her a kiss and Delphine, her trainer, gave her a hug and three lumps of brown sugar, not to mention an excellent feed of carrots when she was all cool and calm after the race. Since it was the last race of the day and indeed the year, it was early November, the van, which already had its four horses had left before her race began. So as to come back and get her, but now the van was late. The stable was empty and Rania, her groom had, she said, gone to the bathroom. And why not in the stall, thought Paris, but she could never get an answer to that question. Twilight was descending over the vast green expanse of Otoy racecourse. The jumps had dimmed into dark shapes against the still vivid green grass. Admiring this, Paris did something that she often did. 
she pressed against the door of the stall. And this time, something happened that had never happened before. It swung open. After a moment, Paris stepped carefully out onto the fine, crunchy gravel and snorted. Everything remained quiet. She could see now that every stall was empty and dark. In fact, the green of the race course was the brightest color around, so bright that for a moment she didn't dare head out there. But Paris was a very curious filly. At her feet were several items that Rania had left behind. The grooming box full of brushes, Paris's blue blanket, and something that Paris knew was called a purse. This was the only thing that interested Paris. She had seen lots of purses and heard even more about them. She had, it, <clears throat> in fact, just won a purse. And so she thought this would certainly be it. She dropped her nose, snuffled a bit, and found the handle. She picked it up and trotted out of the stable, the stable yard onto the race course. Really, she thought, for a home, for a horse who had just run a long race and with 14 jumps, she felt quite full of beans. She kicked up her heels and gave a squeal. To begin with, Paris had no idea of making a getaway. Not only did she like racing and Delphine and Rania and her owner, Madeline, and several of the other horses, as well as her nice clean stall up here in Maison Lafitte, she really didn't know much else. None of the horses did. All had been born on pleasant farms in the country and all had come to Maison Lafitte when they were hardly more than babies and all had been galloping and eating and riding in the van and racing and galloping and eating and racing for quite a while. As long as Paris could clearly remember, actually. It was an active life. And in Maison Lafitte, there was plenty to see of a morning, especially if you raced over jumps. But the horses did talk among themselves about what else might be out there. Some worldly ones who had traveled from down south or from across the sea had seen different courses. They lorded it over the others a bit. There were also those who talked about escaping this life, but they never talked about what else they might do. Paris did not think that any of them were as curious as she was. And here was the grass Turf, they called it, but grass really as thick and green and appetizing as it could possibly be. And a racehorse never got to eat a strand of it, never even thought of doing such a thing. Mm. A race course was for racing. Paris took a few bites. Mm. And um, so I'll stop there. Oh, that's so lovely. I deeply admire the depth and the love in these characters. And I, I know you have a, a dog named Frida. And you have extensive. Oh, we did. Yeah. Frida. Oh, you did. Oh. Yeah. She. She was. Uh, I think she was fifteen, maybe sixteen when she died. But she was the okay. inspiration for the dog Frida. Oh, wonderful. She was a German short hair, and even though, and we adopted her when she was about a year and a half old, I guess. Mm -hmm. And um, even though she had lots of fun, she always looked sad and sort of gloomy when she was laying in her chair. So oh. that was an interesting <laughs> aspect. I, I always, always <laughs> called her an, a, a German existentialist, you know. That's hilarious. What, that said, did uh, was Frida the first character that came to you? Uh, how did this menagerie of unlikely friends assemble? No, the first character that came to me was my horse, Paris. Okay. His, his name was Paris Stroika and um, whose nickname is Paris. And what the reason was that I went to, to I, I'd had her, she, let's see that this was about 2008 and she was about three years old, which is about the same age as a race horse. And she'd been to the racetrack, but she hadn't enjoyed it. I don't think. Okay. And um, anyway, I was in Paris and I was visiting a woman there actually from Wisconsin. <laughs> who is a very successful racehorse trainer in France. Hmm. Interesting. And I keep waiting for her to write her own book. Her name hmm. is Gina Rarick. Hmm. Anyway, I visited her and then I came in and I went to this 
restaurant in a place I hadn't been before, which is on the west side of the Seine, up a steep hill called the Place de Trocadero. And we had an un incredibly delicious bowl of uh, French onion soup. Mm. And I said to my husband, you know, what would be really funny would be if a horse escaped the racetrack and came here. Yeah. And then I looked around and I said, oh, that's totally ridiculous. But when we walked around that side of Paris, which would be um, the Place de Trocadero, some of the narrow, some of the nearby streets, the river, and then um, the Champ de Mar and this and the Eiffel Tower. I remember this was in 2008 before they made a lot of changes to the area around the Eiffel Tower. Um, I thought it was really a fascinating era area. And so I thought, well, you know, it's totally unlikely, but it's remotely possible and why not? And so that's what was the inspiration for the book. I love it. And one of the many things um, I love about this book and then other readers do as well that I've seen in other interviews with you is that there's no villain. <laughs> Even the local gendarme is, is kind of charming. <laughs> Yeah, he so is. I, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I loved him. I kept waiting for the well other shoe to drop, and well at a certain meaning. point, exactly, at a certain point, I realized, no, he's just, he's just kind of a sweet guy. Um, I'd but love I to hear more. Say, you know, people have brought this up, and what yeah. I say is, life for the for these characters, life is the villain, mm. and life itself is the thing that has presented the challenges, and and they've had to overcome plenty of challenges. <laughs> Um, especially the old lady who's who's one of the main characters, mm -hmm. but also her her great grandson who's yeah. um, who's quite young. So I didn't want to put in some bad guy and then distract um, the readers from just the the idea of making it day by day in a world where you don't know what's next. So that was my that was my goal. Excellent. Uh, real quick aside here. Uh, someone in the audience wants to mention that she's named her puppy Frida after reading this book. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's that. have a talk about Frida. I was at a, I was at a horse show and a, a young woman walked by with Frida and she's the most beautiful dog I ever saw. And um, I, I jumped up and I said, oh, what a beautiful dog. And she said, well, the owner wants to put her up for adoption. I said, I'll take her. And it turned out that she had done some damage around the house when the owner was outside or away or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I had had Great Danes. Great Danes, Great Danes ripped the backs off of, of couches and um, take take all the stuffing out of their arms and they steal things from <laughs> from shel shelves and so i did i thought i could handle that and she never did anything bad in our house so awesome um she was a really good dog oh that's so nice to hear uh in the la times interview uh they call this novel wholly apolitical and added, in an era beset by polarization and even violent tribalism, it feels like a gift to find a novel in which characters <laughs> of different species with different desires and instincts come together to build a community. So yeah, please tell us more about what inspired this. Well, the first characters that came to me were the animal characters. Mm -hmm. So there was Frida and there was Paris and then you know, I, of course, obviously, I had to do a lot of research. So I had to go back and forth to Paris a lot and walk. <laughs> oh, poor me, right? Yeah, burden <laughs> some research. Indeed. Yeah. Eat a lot of macaroons and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and when I was in the uh, Champ de Mar, I noticed the ravens, uh, hmm. the bands of ravens. And then there used to be, I don't think, I don't know if it's still there, but there used to be a little pond or a little pair of ponds 
not far from the Eiffel Tower. And I noticed mallards in there. So I thought mm. that would be fun. The mallards are quite beautiful ducks. And I thought that'd be fun yeah. to put them in there. Um, I walked down the streets, looked at the houses. The houses were quite old, you know, maybe a hundred or more years old, very substantial. And I figured there would be rats in the walls. Why not? So I decided to introduce the two rat characters. Mm. So there's the, the dog, the horse, the mallards, the raven, and the two rats. And then the, the human characters were more for practical reasons. Mm. I, would, I said to myself, okay, where would the dog, not, not Paris, because she only is out and about at night, but where would the dog go and who would the dog see and encounter and, and um, how maybe would that, would those relationships grow? So the characters sort of came in. Now, Etienne, the boy, he's kind of like me as a boy because when I was little, I was, a, I was a, excuse me, totally obsessed with horses. Mm -hmm. So my true dream would have been to go out to the, a park or to our lawn or to somewhere and see, have a horse show up. And so, you know, here's my fantasy, my fantasy self. Uh, it, yeah. And as you mentioned earlier, you had the genesis for this novel while you were in Paris thinking mm -hmm. about what an unlikely scenario this was. Uh, so you never considered another setting. I was just curious what factors were important to you when you decided to set it in Paris and in this section of Paris, particularly. Well, this section is not quite as or because of the Champ de Mar, but also because of um, some other places, too. It's not quite as urban as central Paris. And it's she'd be more likely to escape notice there hmm. in this section. Okay. Um, it's also a very beautiful section because of the terrain. And it's also reasonably, there's a forest, the Bois de Boulogne is on the far side of this section. And so there's a, there's a way that she could, she could conceivably get into town um, through the, from Otoy Racecourse through the Bois de Boulogne. And I didn't see, there was no other part of town that I could see this was even possible. I see. So, um, so there were practical reasons, but also it's just, I, I think it's a fascinating area. Um, and there is a very interesting graveyard up the hill from the Place de Trocadero. Mm. Um, and that's where Frida's owner often sleeps. So. Mm. Right. Or right. Did sleep before he died. He died. He's died. He's already died before the book starts. Yeah. Jacques Soul. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Jacques Soul. Cool, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool stage name. Yeah. We never learned his real name, I don't think. But I don't yeah. think Frida knew that either. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, many of the other books of yours I've read largely take place in the Midwest, uh, particularly mm -hmm. Iowa, where you spent 24 years. And so what attracted, uh, what attracted and tracks you to Iowa as a setting? And do you know yet if any future novels may take place there? Well, I moved to Iowa because um, my first husband got accepted to uh, the history department mm. at the university. So we, when we moved to Iowa, we lived, we didn't live in Iowa City. We rented a house on a farm that had been sold and the house was going to be a tear down, but it hadn't been torn down yet. <laughs> um, it was outside of, just on the far side of Wellman. Mm. And <clears throat> it was a nice house and we liked it. But going back and forth to, from Iowa City to Wellman was really fascinating for me. And then at the same time that we were living there, I happened to read a book by Barry Commoner called The Closing Circle about pesticides and the, and the natural world. Now, the other great thing about that particular spot was that if you walked uh, to the left, kind of down the road, there was a wetland preserve that was very beautiful. 
So here I was, you know, I could go into Iowa City, which was cosmopolitan and enjoyable. I could come back to Wellman through farm country mm. um, and through Kelowna, which was fascinating because of the Amish population. Mm, yeah. And then I could walk down the road into a wetland that was very natural. And so that made me think about um, Iowa and farming. And then when I finished my degree at the University of Iowa, the, the place that hired me to teach was Iowa State. Mm -hmm. And so when I moved to Ames, I saw that Ames was in many ways completely different from, it was another part of Iowa. And so I understood living in Iowa that Iowa is as individual and idiosyncratic as any other state that what other people thought about it was just wrong. And it was really worth investigating sort of the, the natural world and the economic world and the social world of Iowa. I loved, I loved teaching at Iowa State. I loved Ames. I thought it was the best place in the world to have children. Mm -hmm. um and and actually you know given who i'm talking to one of the great things about ames was zip you could go straight north and there you were in minneapolis and it was there you were you know it was it wasn't paris but it was almost yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I i was i was blessed to have grown up about 45 minutes away from minneapolis in hastings minnesota and that was my city growing up and was very fortunate to have that be my city. Yeah. We actually almost moved there, but the year that we thought about moving there was the year when the snow started pouring down before thanks before Halloween. Halloween. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I don't was that what year was that 86 oh. or 87 something like that? 87 or 88. Yeah. It was it was right around there because I remember we had just moved uh, to a new neighborhood where I don't think we'd trick or treat it yet. And uh, yeah, we didn't get the chance to. <laughs> yeah, and it was, it was way, it was, we thought it was way too scary mm -hmm. to live in that kind of, that much snow. So, right, so we, right. over, we did not move to Minneapolis, but we were tempted. Yeah, it's still there. Yeah. I, I think about it myself too sometimes. I'm tempted every time I go back. <laughs> <laughs> So your, your, your career as an author is quite prolific, 30 books. Uh, what good habits can you credit for your steady writing and publication pace? Well, I have to say probably curiosity. Mm. You know, I get interested in things and it's this, I mean, Perestroika in Paris is a good example of that. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I get interested in, in things and I look around and I think, oh, hmm that might be a good idea. Mm. And then I start doing the research. So perfect example of that actually is a thousand acres. And guess where we were driving from? We were driving back from Minneapolis. Mm. Um, and it was late in the day, it was dusk and we were coming down 35. Mm -hmm. And I was looking around and I'd been sort of planning to do the King Lear book um, for a long time. And I was looking around and that northern section that's very flat. And I thought, you know, this is an interest. This would be an interesting spot to set, set that Lear book. And then I looked up um, that area. And it was really interesting because of the marshy landscape and um, the, the drill wells that drain, the draining wells that drain the water into um, the groundwater. And also because of the unbelievable fertility of that section. And I thought this is, this is really an interesting place to set that Lear book. And the more I looked it up, the more interesting it got. And so quite often I am inspired by place. 
sometimes by oddball characters, but other most of the time by place and how interesting different places are. Sorry about that. Yeah, no problem. Okay, one last question for me, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Uh, I've read that Frank Marshall and Barry Sonnenfeld are tackling Perestroika in Paris as an animated feature. Do you have mm -hmm. any updates? <laughs> They're still at it, you know. Okay, you good. Know with Hollywood, it could could happen tomorrow. It could happen after you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. You just hope for the best, but they're very enthusiastic. That's wonderful and to hear. So that's all I care about. They're they're very experienced. They're very enthusiastic, and let's just hope it happens. Yeah, yeah. I I hope so too. I think it'd be wonderful to see. Well, we have no shortage of questions from the audience tonight, Good. so I'll turn it over to them. I'll begin with this one, hope it's in advance. What read-alike suggestions might you have for a YA reader who has already read the Horses of Oak Valley Ranch series twice? <laughs> well, that's really sweet. Um, uh, has she also read the um, three sequels to the Horses of Oak Valley Ranch? Oh. Hmm. Because there's a character in, um, in the Horses of Oak Valley Ranch, who's a student of Abby, the, the main character of those books. And I was very fond of her. Her name is Ellen mm. and she is contrary. And I thought I would write about, and they're, they're actually for slightly younger readers, but I think they're fun and I quite enjoy them. The first one is called um, Riding Lessons. Oh, excellent. and it's about this contrary girl who um, who loves horses and who also believes that the horses and, and is contrary and has her own ideas of what's what's right and what's wrong. Um, but she also believes that the horses are are talking to her. Mm. That was a fun thing. Abby's very practical. But Ellen believes the horses are talking to her. And that was a fun thing to explore. Oh, I love it. Uh, next question is, uh, did you get any pushback from your editorial team on having no villain? It's charming, but needless to say, not the norm. <laughs> no, the editorial okay, team were fine with it. Um, I had been working on it for such a long time that by the time that I suggested that we, I guess it was, to, let's see, 2015, no, goodness gracious, not much re more recently than that, it was 2019 when I suggested that maybe they should look at it and, and, um, and publish it. And, and I said, you know, maybe you should publish it around after, after the election and because it's, it's, it might be a relief from whatever will be going on mm. around the election. And they were happy to have no villain um, uh, for this book. It's also a little bit, you know, it's, I hope and I wish that it'll appeal to young readers and adult readers. And, you know, for young readers, I don't think there has to be a villain, you know. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, as you, as you put it so well earlier, life is villain enough, mm -hmm. particularly when you're young and you feel like so much is stacked against you. <laughs> Yeah. 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 I, I, I don't typically have villains in my books either. And I, yeah, I don't really, that. <laughs> yeah, I, no, I don't really see a need for it. Uh, I mean, quite often in my characters' lives, um, their, their economic status is enough of an antagonist. Yeah. Um, and my, yeah. my, my characters feel the same way. Question yeah. is, are we going to get anything to eat? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. 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 And I mean, um, Etienne, he he's has his, he has to take care of his great, great grandmother, his great grandmother, not his great yes. grandmother, but he has to take care of her. And it might be just a little more than he can handle. So that in some sense is part of his dilemma. Right, right. And your characters in some luck, for example, they're too busy. They, like if they had a villain, like they wouldn't have time for them. You know? <laughs> they're, they're just, you know, uh, getting through each day. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's one of the reasons I love that book. Yeah. 
Uh, let's see, next question. Um, you picture Paris' story as a one-off kind of narrative experiment, or might we see more stories in the style from you? Well, um, I have thought about a sequel. Mm. And, uh, and the reason I thought about that is because um, the horse that I'm riding is really an interesting gelding. He's a really interesting guy. And I can imagine the two, he and Paris having serious, uh, dis, uh, uh, serious discussions about philosophical issues mm. with her rolling her eyes and saying, oh, that's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> but he's a beauty. And, and so um, I thought maybe in the sequel, it, Etienne and Paris would be, you know, maybe eight years older. Mm. And they would move to another part of France that is more rural and maybe a little more mysterious. And maybe there would be a villain. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Um, it's kind of, this kind of question I, I, I hear sometimes myself, and I suppose it was inevitable after bringing up the film adaptation. But do you have any sort of dream voice talent casting for the, for the feature? You know, my dream voice talent is Gabriel Byrne. And that comes oh. from me listening to him read his own books. Wow. And he does all of the accents in his books so well. Wow. You know, even though his books are nonfiction and they're, they're um, reminiscences. Mm -hmm. um, he's lived in a lot of different places. And so he would be my dream voice talent for the animation but i'm not sure he would take it but it would be fun to have him but there's plenty of guys plenty of guys and women who could do the voices and so it's entirely up to mr sonnenfeld and, and uh frank marshall this question's from a reader who says she first encountered you with thousand acres she's always wanted to ask a pulitzer prize winner what was it like to win that major award? How were you informed and what is involved for the recipient? <laughs> well, that's actually quite a funny story and I, I'm, I'm glad she asked it. So um, it was 1992 and I was pregnant with my son and um, I was in the kitchen with my daughter, my older daughter who was then 14. And I had been on the phone with a editor from the New York Times because I was doing a book review for her. And so uh, then the phone rang again and I picked that up. And it was somebody, uh, it was somebody from the Des Moines Register. Mm. And they said, what have you heard lately? I said, I don't know. I said, well, okay, have you heard anything about um, the Pulitzer Prize? I said, nope. And so then they said, okay, okay, okay. If it turned out that you had won the Pulitzer Prize, what would you say? So I said something, I don't even remember what it was. And then I turned to my daughter and I said, honey, I think I won the Pulitzer Prize. And, you know, being 14, she looked at me and said, huh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Who cares? Yeah, uh, right. What then, I went, uh, then I went over to the campus and I was waiting for my class to start. And I was sitting in my office and, it, and two o'clock was the time when all the news went out on the wires back in those days. Mm -hmm. And I... The, and at exactly two o'clock, the phone started ringing. And all these people from, you know, small Iowa newspapers, fancy newspapers, all kinds of people were asking me what I, what I thought. And then I heard someone running down the hallway. And I opened the door and I saw the person suddenly stop. She was carrying the um, Ames Tribune. Oh, right. She was the stringer for the Des Moines Register. And the woman who, the guy who called me was from the Ames Tribune. 
and she was carrying the Ames Tribune and she'd opened it up and she said, oh shit. And it turned out <laughs> that the Des Moines Register had been scooped by the Ames Tribune. <laughs> yeah, I love it. <laughs> So I didn't do anything much because I was pregnant. I didn't want to go on the road, but um, so I just got some flowers and some boxes of chocolates and some congratulations. And that was plenty for me. That was fine. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, next question is, uh, how long does it usually take you to write a manuscript? It really varies um, from book to book. Some have, some have taken longer than others. And it, a lot of it depends on how much research I have to do and what's available. So um, when I was writing the trilogy, the last 100 years trilogy, <clears throat> I started writing um, each episode or each book at the beginning of January and then I would get to the end sometime in June. And then I would set it aside and come back to it um, in the fall. So, and guess where I was going in the summer? Well, I was going up to Lac de Flambeau, Wisconsin, where we had yeah. a, a lovely uh, summer house. And so, you know, so those books took me about five and a half, six months, a little more per volume. Um, other books have been quicker. Other books have been taken much longer. It just very, it just depends on what I know and what I don't know about what's going on and how well I understand the characters and the setting and the plot. I, I, I will say that when I was writing A Thousand Acres, the, the task that I set myself was to adhere as closely as was realistically possible to King Lear. Mm -hmm. And there was a moment, I think toward the end of act three, maybe the beginning of act four, where I realized that I'd gone off track and I had to sort it out and figure out a way to get back to my original um, goal. So it, it depends on how well I stick with it and you know what my goal is and what's easy and what's not easy. Characters, excuse me, characters are usually relatively easy. But when I was writing Private Life and the, the main male character was uh, what I would call a crackpot, mm. he was very difficult to understand. And I had a hard time with him. Um, but characters in general are kind of easier than, um, and, than other parts. I love writing about setting. That's probably my favorite thing to write about. Mm. And, um, you know, it just varies from book to book. One audience member writes, good faith is one of my favorites of your work and your knowledge of the real estate business blows this reader away. What research did you do to prepare for that? I talked to my husband. Oh. <laughs> before he came to California, he was a realtor in Pennsylvania, mm. outside of Philadelphia. And one of the reasons I wrote that book was because he had some issues with his career back there. Mm. And I said, okay, let's write a book about it. It's, it's interesting and it's also pertinent. Um, and so he was the one who, who sort of taught me how to think about it and um, how to uh, know what, to do with regard to the real estate world, mm. especially in the eighties, which is when the book takes place. He's not a realtor in California anymore. Okay. What, uh, another question uh, that the writer phrases as a deep thinking question. 
Because you have such a long string of books over so many decades, did you ever think of your stories as an autobiography of your journey as an author? And would you have approached any older projects differently if you had tackled them today? No. Mm -hmm. yeah. they, they just came along one at a time. I, I, I took them on because they interested me. Um, I'm not one of those people who's going to go back and rewrite their work. I think I think William Butler Yeats went back and rewrote some of his poetry. Um, I'd rather just keep going and trying new stuff and doing stuff and um, not not try to second guess myself or my former self. Mm -hmm. Someone in one audience member's book club told her that Jane's husband reads all of her drafts and offers other input as well. If that's the case, what can you share about this working relationship? Well, he doesn't read them. I read them to him. Even better. Yeah. So when I write something during the day, then the next morning uh, before I start the next episode or the next bit that I'm writing, I read it aloud to him. And then the, the, the good thing for me is that I can see the mistakes that I made, like the gram grammar or mistakes or the spelling mistakes and correct those. Um, but I also can sense how he, whether he understands it, whether it makes sense to him. And quite often he'll have a suggestion or two. Mm. And I found that once I started doing that, reading, reading aloud to him, that it was easier to make the rough draft come together. So, he, so I, I think the benefit for me is there's two. One is having him hear it and one and respond. And one is having myself read it aloud. And when I was teaching creative writing, I, I begged my students to read their stories aloud to themselves before they turned them in, because then they would catch the grammatical errors and the spelling errors. And I think that's really important. Yeah, I, I do the same thing. I read everything I write to Brooke. Uh, at night after after the day is done uh -huh. and I agree there's no replacement for it mm -hmm. it's it's improved my work as much as anything yeah both for the same two reasons uh you stated both in terms of me catching mistakes but also her input yeah, yeah. and I think you know one of my favorite authors is Anthony Trollope mm. and he uh had his wife uh read his books and correct them. Mm. And um, so she, she offered critiques and she offered suggestions. And I think one of the things that happened in Trollope's oeuvre, and which is enormous and way bigger than mine will ever be, um, was that he became more and more interested in women characters and, and women's issues as he kept going. And mm. I'm sure that that was part of his wife's influence on his work. Wow. And so from my point of view, I think he's one of the most insightful 19th century authors about women, the complexity of women's natures, the complexity of their situations and how to get them to change or learn or whatever. And I think that was because his wife helped him. Yeah, well, that's cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, next uh, question from a reader is, were you living in Iceland when you wrote The Greenlanders? And what was no, your- No, I had. Oh, you I had, had, okay. Iceland. I was living in the <coughs> And uh, what was, yeah, and the follow-up In that, order to do my research into how terribly cold it was in Greenland, I went to Minneapolis. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you got it. You got it. No, I had been to, I spent time in Iceland in, in graduate school, um, starting in 76 and ending in 77 during the school year. And when I was there, and I loved the Icelandic sagas, and I enjoyed Iceland quite a bit. And when I was there, I got really interested in the, the sagas that talked about Greenland. And I knew that I wanted to write a, a book that would be similar to a saga, 
Now the sagas, the Greenland sagas in um, the medieval Greenland sagas are about the founding of the Greenland colony, obviously. They're not about how it ended, but I was fascinated by how it ended. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to write my own saga um, about the end of the Greenland colony. And, but I knew I needed practice. And so I decided I was gonna wait for, you know, 10 years and try other books and, and do and, and get a little experience before I did something that I had no idea of what I was going to do. So in, um, I started it in the early eighties in the summer of 84, I did go to Greenland for about two weeks and, and look around, it was really interesting. And then I went to Denmark and there was a great museum of archeological finds from Greenland. And a lot of them were very well preserved because of the boggy soil and the freezing weather. So that was fascinating too. Um, and then it turned out that a guy that I had met after, uh, after graduate school, when I worked on an archeological dig in Winchester, England, he, he became a Greenland archeologist. Hmm. And so he, um, I sent the manuscript to him and he read it and he said that it was accurate as far as he could say. Um, so it was one that I sort of could not, not do. I had to do it. It was, uh, it fascinated me and I loved the sagas when I was reading them. So I had to do it. Next question is, uh, do you have any say in the cover art used in your books? Uh, this reader thinks Perestroik in Paris is really cute and loves the font titles in the last hundred years trilogy as well. Well, they, you know, they show it to you. And if you really hate it, they think about, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but I quite like this one, apart from the fact that the, and in the, and this is not true of the paperback edition, which is basically oh. the same cover, but in, in the hardback edition, this the particular map? horse is a male. Oh, oh yeah, you're right. <laughs> So I hadn't, I, it's my fault. I didn't notice that uh, when they first showed me the cover, but some of the covers I really loved and um, I've really been grateful for the artists who do their best to, you know, to do the cover art. Does the paperback edition also include the, um, the, the lovely map? That's I believe so. I haven't gotten my copies of it, so I haven't opened it up yet, but I bet it does because okay. most people need it. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Oh, great question. Trollop and sagas. Wouldn't have expected either. So great. <laughs> what contemporary authors have you been eating up lately? Well, though, you know, I found this one. This is one of my favorite authors, and I found it under a stack of books. And I said, shit, why didn't I read this one before? This is Man of Parts by David Lodge. Oh. And it's a oh, fictional it rendering of H.G. Wells' later life. It's totally hmm. fascinating. Um, I, I read, um, let's see, I'm also reading... Dawson's Fall by Roxana Robinson. Uh, Roxana and I are doing a little Facebook group where she reads Some Luck and I read Dawson's Fall. Oh, I love it. And um, I really liked um, The Overstory by Richard Powers. I thought that was really good. And then I also listen to audiobooks. And so the audiobook I've been listening to is Ashes and Elmer. I think it's Ashes and Elm. And it's a sort of new revised history of the Vikings. Um, oh. and that's good. And unlike a lot of historians, the, <laughs> the guy who wrote it has a very good sense of humor. So, <laughs> so every oh, so often you're reading about all these horrifying things and then he makes a little joke and it's, and it's sort of funny. 
Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, this reader asks, I just finished a swim in a pond in the rain, and I wonder if you have all your books planned out or whether the plot or characters take on a life of their own and direct you. That varies from book to book. Um, mostly I let them go their own way. Um, that was especially true in the trilogy, but they, I wanted to just see what they were like when they were born and then, then see what they did once they were on their feet and running around. And that was quite interesting to me. Um, I, I came to feel like I was, with all the characters in the trilogy, I came to feel like I was sitting on the, in a train car eavesdropping on a whole bunch of people from the same family. And um, mm. so it wasn't, it, it came to feel like I wasn't writing them, they were speaking for themselves. And that was really fun. I like that. Yeah, I do too. That's when I feel like I'm at my best is when they're dictating mm -hmm. or, or when I'm taking dictation from them. Yeah, yeah I totally agree. Uh, one reader wants to know what books or kinds of books did you read to get through the pandemic? Did you read it? Did oh. your reading habits change? Uh. <laughs> no, my reading habits didn't change. Um, Mine didn't either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm always reading something. Yeah. And so, and I go, I, I read several books at the same time and I go kind of slow and you know, I'll, I'll sprinkle in maybe a PG Woodhouse for some for some comic relief, or how I I I'll sprinkle in a Trollope just because I love his work, or mm. I'll read something that I've read before to see if I see if it feels different. Um, but no, my reading habits didn't change. You get inundated with requests from authors and publicists to read and blurb books. Uh, much, but that I, I don't do it so it stopped okay. yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah sometimes yeah, you to... know I got a quest I, I got a blurb request for a teenager's a, a teen horse book that I thought was funny mm. and I blurb that one mm. um I got a blurb request from Frank Schaefer who I think is a really interesting guy um and uh i i blurbed his book but in general i don't blurb fiction and you know it's conceivable that i'll blurb nonfiction, but there's a lot of stuff in nonfiction that i don't know enough to know whether it's any good or not you know i i'm more interested in what i have to learn from nonfiction rather than what i think about it okay one reader wants to know if do you or have you dealt with horses professionally? No. Okay. I, mean, I have horses and I've, I've showed horses and I've taken a lot of lessons and I've supported horses, but, and I've owned a couple of race horses, but I, I always have trainers who help me. So no, I haven't dealt with horses professionally. Okay. Let's see. Do you get feedback from members of the farming community on the realism of your work? Well, when I was when I was touring for Some Luck and the other books, yes, I got feedback then, and it was generally positive. I didn't. Um, nobody said this is a crackpot, stupid. You know, <laughs> it was it was generally positive. I tried I try to be as realistic and honest and accurate as I can. And if someone doesn't like something, then I might change it or we might just talk about it and talk about what the difference is. But no, I haven't had a problem with that. Yeah. One reader wants to know if you have any famous fans who've told you or who you've learned <laughs> through the grapevine are fans of your work. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Barry Sonnenfeld, apparently. <laughs> yeah. All right, we're at the uh, five minute mark here. So um, I think that's just about it. I've got a, a few closing remarks to make here. Um, if there's any last question, I might be able to fit it in. Uh, but in the meantime, I'll 
start wrapping it up. Jane, wow, thank you. This has been fantastic. It's been a pleasure to talk to you again. Oh, it's thanks. been a That's few years. It yeah, been. thanks. Yeah, it's been a few years since I last saw you in South Dakota, and I hope we both get to do that event again sometime. <laughs> that would be fun. That would be fun. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Oh, yeah. One one last question, and this is de rigueur, uh, it seems. Uh, what's next from you, Jane? <laughs> Can you share anything about what you're working on? Um, yeah, I have a book coming out in about a year. Uh, it's a murder mystery. It's set in Monterey, uh, California, where, near where I live, uh, in the 1850s. Mm. And that was quite an interesting time in Monterey history because for one year, Monterey was, was, the, was the capital of California. Wow. And, then, and then everything, then the gold rush sort of came in and all the important stuff moved north. But Monterey is a really interesting town. It has, a, they've done a wonderful job of um, re keeping the buildings uh, and in good shape, the, the ones that were around in the 1850s. And so it's fascinating to walk around and to imagine. And it also has a very beautiful natural landscape so it's fascinating. It was fascinating to imagine what a murder mystery like that might have might have been. Mm. Fantastic. What kind of resources did you uh, take advantage of to find out more about Monterey of that time? Oh, there's a Monterey Historical Society, and um, there's a lot of historical buildings, and so there was plenty. There were plenty of resources. That was not oh. a problem at all. Excellent. Oh, it looks like we do have one more uh, question sneak in here. Uh, do you have a favorite writing spot or nook or any writing rituals? Well, I, I, I think here I am, the modern version of Marcel Proust. I sit up in my bed and I write on my computer. Mm. <laughs> nice. All right. Well, I believe that's all we have time for this evening. Uh, thank you again, Jane, for making well, time. Thank for you, tonight. Jay Ryan. It's nice to see you again. Nice to see you too. This has been a virtual presentation of the book. I'm sorry, Jane? I said stay warm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, this has been a virtual presentation of Club Book, a long-running literary series from Elsa made possible by the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Special thanks again to Carver County Library for the part they played bringing Jane to us. Before you log off, look for the Club Book survey link, which is in the comments, and will be projected in place of my video momentarily. As it happens, tonight's program is the last in the series uh, fall lineup, but don't worry, Club Book will be back again in the spring. Sign up for the e-newsletter, like them on Facebook, or be among the first to learn which best-selling and award-winning authors are coming to Twin Cities Libraries in March and April. With that, I'll sign out. Have a great night, everyone. <laughs>